I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Acts chapter 12 and verse 5. Acts chapter 12 and verse 5. Let's stand for the reading of God's word. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. How many know Peter didn't stay, stay anywhere very long? There was two things about Peter. He didn't keep his mouth shut and he didn't stay in one place very long. But Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. I want to use for a subject tonight Peter's prison break. You may be seated. The prison break of Peter. Amen. I have not only a very intelligent wife, but a very pretty wife. I enjoy her wisdom, I really do. The other night I went to bed, her and I went to bed and I said, I smell cabbage. <laughs> and it stinks. And she says, honey, you love to eat cabbage. And she had put some on her knee or ankles and where her joints were. And I said, yeah, I love cabbage, but not after it is laid on feet. At my house, we know that corn, green beans, and peas are good for the joints and the ankles and the elbows. And I know that's true because I've seen Judy with a frozen bag of peas on her elbow. And so green beans, peas, and corn, frozen bag, there you go. Who needs an ice pad? Who needs a... Uh, ice to put when you got frozen vegetables in the freezer. Just go to it, and green beans, corn, and peas is good for any ailment in your joints of your body. Amen? Praise God. Now, I want to talk to you about the prison break of Peter. This is one of the most outstanding, one of the most incredible lessons that we can learn and miracle that we see where the church is praying without ceasing for the jailbreak of Peter, for the release of Peter. I believe they were praying for Peter's release. Even though they didn't believe it when he got out, and there was a lot of doubt and unbelief in their hearts when Peter went to the door and knocked, and they didn't believe it was Peter. And Rhoda said, it really is. And they said, you're out of your mind. You're mad. And so they, isn't that just like us? We pray for God to do something and then when God does it, we go, really? Wow, wasn't expecting that to happen. Well, there goes faith right out the window. But we wanna say that God's been good to us, amen? How many ever prayed for something you really didn't think it was gonna happen, but it happened? Isn't that good? That means you had nothing to do with it. That means God had everything to do with it. Amen? I used to have a guy uh, our church, we had a guy ministering in our church and uh, several years ago, and he was out of a car. He couldn't drive. His car, he broke down, and he wanted a car. And um, the church had prayed, and, you know, we could find a way to help him, and the church got together, and they, they bought him a car. And the next morning, the, the next Sunday, he stood up and got ready to sing, and he made this announcement. I've been praying for a car, and God gave me a car. Well, when he said that, I realized that he was taking credit because he said, I've been praying in faith. I have faith that God would give me a car, and God gave me a car. Let, let's remember one thing. If we're shouting, let's make sure we're shouting because God did it, not because we achieved something in our life. Amen? And so that, that just kind of turned me off. And then later on, he wanted to be used. He wanted to preach. And I finally opened up an outreach for him to preach. And, and he kept telling me, I want to be used. I want to be used. I want to be used. He'd tell me that every week. I want to be used. This was several years ago. You don't know him. And finally, I put him in a place of tent meeting and some a ministry. And he was preaching. And then he got disgruntled. He said, I just feel like the pastor's using me. 
I just feel like the church is using me. And it, you know, that'd been his cry for days and weeks and months. Use me. I want to be used. And then he said, I just feel like the church is using me. The pastor's using me. Well, you know what? We need to keep tuned up and just in a right place with the Lord, right? I mean, we'd agree to that. And so I want to talk to you about Peter's prison break. And uh, I don't know how long I'll preach, but I will say this. Peter was kept in prison. And he was put in prison because he was preaching the gospel. He was put in prison because Peter was a good Peter. He wasn't put in prison because of anything evil he did. He wasn't put in prison by anything, any law he broke. He was put in prison because he loved Jesus and the Jewish leaders of that day hated Jesus. And they hated the message that Peter preached. And because they hated what he was doing for Jesus, Herod Agrippa, which was the first Herod of Agrippa, rose up and imprisoned Peter in prison. Now Peter's in jail, and the Bible says that the church is praying without ceasing on behalf of Peter. And they're praying, and they're praying, and they're praying. I mean, no prayer works. God moved because they prayed. And Peter was kept in prison, and by the way, there's a, there's a miracle involved in this by itself. It was unjust, it was, it was unfair. The restraint and arrest of Peter was totally unfair. I mean, no, the world is unfair. Amen? We say, well, the world isn't treating me right. Well, what do you expect it to do? Right? Say, well, sickness and disease and heartaches and problems and, and financial, it's not treating me right. Well, what do you expect it to treat you? Everything is adverse. Satan is trying to destroy your life. And he hated you before you became a Christian and he double hates you now that you are a Christian. The devil does. First John chapter five verse 19 says, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Boy, that could be put above the halls of Congress today. The whole world lieth in wickedness. That could be put everywhere around the planet. The whole world lieth in wickedness. It's in the lap of the devil. Well, as long as the world is in the lap of the devil, I choose to be in the lap of my Jesus. I want like a little boy just to get up in the lap of Jesus and let Jesus watch over me, amen? I don't wanna, I don't wanna ever wander too far away from my shepherd. In fact, I don't wanna wander any distance away from my Lord and Savior. I wanna stay close to him. I wanna stay in the book, the Bible, I want to stay in the spirit, the Holy Ghost. I want to stay in the profession of my faith. I want to stay in the church. I want to stay in the message of God's blessing. I want to stay close to my Jesus. Because that is the only safe place on planet Earth. There is no safer place than to be in the lap of Jesus Christ. Because the whole world lieth in wickedness or lies in the lap of wickedness. And so Peter was put in jail unjustly. And there was an urgent need for Peter to be rescued. What was the urgent need? Well, in verse uh, 2, 3, and 4, here in Acts chapter 12, it says, And Herod killed James, now that's the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. This is Passover time. And when he had apprehended Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quatruans of soldiers. Four quatruans of soldiers is, one quatruan of soldiers is four, and four quatruans of soldiers is 16 soldiers. How's that? Peter, uh, Herod thought Peter needed 16 soldiers to keep him in line. And 16 soldiers, and basically what they did is the Romans divided the 12 hour night up in four, four hours, and there was four, four hours in the night, and what would happen is four of the 
soldiers would watch for three hours, the next four would watch for three hours, the next four would watch for three hours, the next four would watch for three hours through the night. And that's what it means by four quantuan soldiers was commanded to keep him. Intending after Easter. Now that, that word after Easter means after Passover. To bring Peter forth to the people. What was he going to do? He was going to do to Peter exactly what he did to John, the bro- uh, to James, the brother of John. He was going to behead Peter. He put Peter in jail. He tells the 16 soldiers, don't you let him go. And those four soldiers that were keeping each three hours apiece, they take him down into the middle of prison. And two of those soldiers are chained to Peter. One soldier is chained on one side of Peter by the hand and by the feet, and the other soldier is chained to the other side of Peter by the hand and by his foot, and so he has two soldiers, one on each side. He's chained to those four, those two soldiers, and in the night, you know what Peter does? Peter just goes to sleep. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to be headed, be, if I'm going to be beheaded the next morning, I'm not going to be sleeping. Hello? Hello? You could give me sleeping pills. You could try. In fact, you couldn't even knock me out with a hammer. If I knew I was going to be beheaded the next morning, I would not be sleeping. But Peter had such a trust in Jesus Christ that he realized that if his head was severed, he'd just go to be with his Lord. Peter was so satisfied with his relationship with Christ, he had saw Christ risen from the dead, so Peter wasn't afraid of Herod. He wasn't afraid of death. And the Bible says that Peter had planned, or that Herod had planned to behead Peter after the Passover. And so Peter's asleep, and he's uh, got a, 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 a big, strong soldier on each side of him, and Peter just goes to sleep. Now he's out. I mean, he's taking it easy. And the church is praying. All this time, the church is, oh God, move on Peter's behalf. Oh God, help Peter out of this mess. Oh God, don't let Peter die. We need Peter in the church. We need it messy. Oh God, please help Peter. And all the time, the church was praying without ceasing for Peter. And Peter's asleep, totally comfortable to live is Christ to die is gain. And so Peter wasn't afraid to die, and so he's asleep, and the church is praying. And uh, it sparks an unusual prison break. Because while Peter is sleeping, verse 6 and 7 of Acts 12 says, And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. See, you thought I was just ad living a little bit. No, he was asleep, bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. So two prisoners kept Peter, two prisoners kept the door. Now that's pretty secure. But in verse 7 says, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and the light shined in prison, and he smote Peter on the side and, and raised him up, and saying unto him, Arise quickly. Uh, and when he said to him, Rise quickly, and his chains fell off his feet, and the angel went on to say, Put your shoes on, your sandals on. We're going for a place. Put your, put your, your, your robe on. Put your cloak on. Put your shoes on. It's chilly outside. Put them on. We're going outside. And what's interesting is when the angel of the Lord smote him, he hit him hard enough, it smote him to his feet. Now, I'm not just saying that. I mean, it's in the Bible. It said the angel smote him, and it was a hard enough lick that it raised him up to his feet. And the Bible says he smote Peter on his side and raised him up, saying, I don't wonder the angel just slapped him to his feet, or the angel slapped him and then grabbed him and held him up. So now we're going. And when the angel held him up, the chains fell from his hands and from his feet. And the angel says to Peter, follow me. And so the angel begins to walk. Now, 
I don't know, it doesn't say what the, what the soldiers did, but I can guess. I believe the soldiers just fainted dead right there. When an angel, wouldn't you just faint dead if an angel came down and, and, and slapped Peter up to his feet and the chains fall off? Uh, I don't know where them soldiers went. They either fainted dead or they ran away. And the angel just walks Peter to the door and when he walks him to the door, the inner door, the inner gate, and then the outer gate, he walks him to the door, and the Bible says that when they come, and what happened to the other two soldiers? I don't know, but I know this. When the angel showed up, it's getting out of Dodge time. It's getting out of town time. Now, they wished they'd have kept Peter in because later on Herod killed them because, killed the soldiers because they had let Peter loose. What they expect? What Herod expect the uh, the soldiers to do? Angel shows up. You don't have much of a choice, right? I mean, when an angel of the Lord shows up, it's pretty much over. The battle's done, and Peter is walked out. And all this time he's walking out, Peter's saying, "I'm dreaming." All this time Peter's walking out and he said, you know, I'm really asleep between the two soldiers. I'm really just laying there and I'm just dreaming I'm walking through this prison. He said, I'm just dreaming. He's, I'm in a trance. This ain't really happening. I'm just dreaming. But what happened was the angel took him to the last gate of the city which went out into the streets of the city and the Bible says the gate just opened to its own accord. That's Walmart style. The doors just open wide. And, that, and of course, the angel didn't say welcome to Walmart. The angel said welcome to Jerusalem. And Peter walks out into the street. And the angel disappears. And Peter there free from prison, standing there in the street. Peter says in verse 11, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angel and had delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. You think? Think about that. Peter says, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has come and sent his angel and set me free. Well, what was Peter supposed to think? Of course, God set him free. And so Peter says, okay, I'm gonna go to the house of John, Mark's mother, Mary. And when I go to the house, the church is praying unceasingly for Peter. And when he goes to the house, he goes to the gate, he, his voice speaks up and he says to the little girl named Rhoda, it's Peter, it's Peter, I'm out of jail, let me in. And Rhoda, in the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, by the way, John Mark, and let me say this, I'm gonna, let me take a little tributary a different direction, okay, for a minute. Just take a tributary away. From this river we're in, let me just take a tributary. I don't know how, how far we'll trickle down it, but let's trickle a little bit. In the 14th chapter of St. Mark, you find a person that is wrapped in a towel. He's naked. He's naked. This is when Jesus is arrested. And in the 14th chapter, verse 51 and 52, most Bible scholars believe that this young man, that when Jesus was arrested and he was following Jesus and they grabbed the towel and he was naked under it, the Bible says that this young man ran off naked. Now it doesn't say that he was young, but I don't know any old people that's gonna run around with a towel naked and run off. And, and most Bible scholars tell us that they believe this is John Mark. Still immature, and the reason he was naked, uh, it was probably a hot Jerusalem night when Jesus was arrested. And so he had just put on a towel about him, 
And when they saw John Mark, they reached for him. And I don't know it for sure it's John Mark, but a lot of people believe that's who it is. That's kind of a, you, you, you know, you read those two verses and um, you, you, you read those two verses there in John, in St. Mark, chapter 14 and 51, verse 51 and 52. You read those two verses and you say to yourself, why is that in there? Hello? Now, be honest. Don't look up here. I mean, come on. Look up here and be honest with me. Wouldn't you say, what is that in there for? Well, it's in there for a reason. Right? And so, I don't know the exact reason, but maybe it would be teaching us, put some clothes on. When you go out in public, put some clothes on. Because you'll never know when you might be exposed. That's good preaching. I don't know why it's in there, but it's in there. Amen? I remember my mama used to always tell me when we were younger, we'd go out and we'd drive fast, fast cars. Mama would always say to me, son, don't leave the house till you put on clean underwear. Now, why a mother would ever say that, I don't have a clue. Nine boys and two girls, I guess it's probably something that a mother would think of. And every time she said, put on some clean underwear, because if you ever have to go to the hospital, you want clean underwear on. And I'd always say to mom, if I ever have a wreck and need to go to the hospital, my underwear won't be clean anyway <laughs> when I get there. I told you we'd deviate, deviate a little bit in this tributary. And so we've trickled out and we're going to go back to the vein of this escape that Peter made. So when he comes to the house of, I think it was where John Mark was. Rhoda was in there. She's a little damsel. And Peter shouts out and says, I'm here. And uh, open the gate. And the little girl named Rhoda ran to the disciples while they're praying. And that girl says to the, the church praying, Peter is at the gate. And they said to Rhoda, you're mad. You're out of your mind. Leave us alone. We're trying to pray for Peter. They're basically saying, Rhoda, go back. We're trying to pray for Peter and you're distur disturbing us. And Rhoda said, well, no, 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 no. Peter's at the door. And finally they said, well, if he's at the door, then it must be his angel. And I just got one thing to say to that. There is dumb, 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 dumb and dumb. If it was his angel, he wouldn't be knocking on the door. Amen. And so they go to the door and they open it and there Peter is and they rejoice. I mean, they are so happy. And they say, this is what happened. And Peter rehearses what took place, his jailbreak. And they go tell James, and this is not the same James. This James is the, James is the brother of Jesus. And they go tell James that Peter had been taken or break, broke out of jail. Herod is furious. Where's Peter? He wants to kill him because he wants to make a statement. And the next morning he gets up and Peter's gone. And he says to his soldiers, where is Peter? The soldiers, I don't know what the soldiers told him, but whatever they told him, it wasn't good enough because Herod put them all to death. 16 soldiers put to death because they let one little Peter loose. Now you can't win against God. No need to try to fight against God. You can't win against God. You can fight God and you're not going to win. And if you're trapped by the world, relax. Because God's bigger than the world. If you're in a prison, and some folks are not in a prison like Peter. Some folks are in a prison like despair or prison like depression or prison like they just don't have a life and they're fearful and afraid. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ wants you to have a life. 
He wants you to get a life, and that life is Jesus Christ because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And if you're going to get a life, you better get Jesus because he's the life. Amen? The Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus Christ said, I am the way. Well, if Jesus is the way, then we need to find out which way he's going and go with him. If he's the way, then we need to go the way that he tells us to go. He says he's the truth. Well, if he's the truth, then we need to listen to what he's saying. And if he's the life, then we need to understand that there is no life outside of Jesus. If you want to live, you got to know Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian, you just exist. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you just exist in a world that's in the lap of wickedness, in a world of trouble, you just exist. But if you know Jesus, you've got a life. Amen? Amen? And, when, and don't tell people, get a life. Don't get mad at people and say, get a life. No, tell them to get Jesus. Because when they get Jesus, they'll have a life. Amen? Now, I'm preaching better than you're responding. I just don't know. You guys just sitting around like you didn't get a long enough nap for Sunday afternoon. So Herod kills these people, and Herod is a bad, bad, bad dude. And so Herod comes a time that Herod's going to give a speech. Look at verse 21 of Acts 12, verse 21 through 23. Herod is about to give a political speech. I'm so sick of political speeches. Because too many idiots are giving them. You say, well, you're not supposed to get political. No, I'm talking about idical people. Not political, idical people. That's not a word, but you know what I'm talking about. God have mercy if some of them become leaders of our country were doomed. Verse 21, and upon a set day, this is the day that Herod's going to die. Upon the set day, arrayed in royal apparel, set upon his throne, Herod did, and made an oration unto them. That's a political speech to Tyre and Sidon. And the people gave a shout saying, it's the voice of a God, all Caesar and and kings that area and, and people that wanted to be kings wanted to be a god. And they said, it's the voice of a god and not a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord, by the way, the same angel that broke Peter out of jail, must have been the same angel that broke Peter out of jail must have not got over how Herod had treated James. Amen? And so Herod gives this beautiful speech, this oration, and the people shouted, it's the voice of a God and not a man. And the angel of the Lord said, that's it, I'm done, it's over, give me the signal, Father, and I'll take him out. And the Father gave the angel of the Lord the signal. Now, some people believe this is Jesus, but I don't believe this is Jesus because I don't believe Jesus appeared as an angel after his resurrection. I believe he did appear as an angel as different uh, aberrations in the Old Testament, but not in the New Testament. And so I believe the angel of the Lord, God's... And you say, well, what is an angel of the Lord? An angel of the Lord is an angel that belongs to the Lord. And that same angel says, I'm fed up with Herod. But he can't do anything without the Father's permission. And I don't know whether he got permission from the Father or from the Son, but he got permission. And while that guy was gloating in his uh, ability to speak and already gloated in his murder of, his martyrdom of James, and by the way, James was the first apostle martyr. He was not the first martyr of the church. Stephen was. Stephen wasn't an apostle. He was a deacon. And so... The angel of the Lord comes down after he gives his little fancy speech and they cried, it's the voice of a God, not a man. And the angel said, the angel smote that guy with worms. 
Now, the worms are so, supposed to come after you're dead, not before you're dead, right? And the Bible says, because he gave not God the glory, he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Now, if it's all the same to you, and I'm sure it is, I, if I'm gonna be eaten by worms, I wanna be dead when I'm being eaten. The preacher, you're so morbid. I know, but it feels good. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. And I don't want to be eaten of worms while I'm alive. Now, evangelistically, you know how evangelists are. They make everything sound, whoo, hallelujah, glory to God. Angel whirled over above Herod, swooped down with his mighty powerful hand, touched Herod, and maggots begin to crawl out of his eyeballs and roll out his mouth and out his ears. And, and Pilate twitched around and shook and fell off his little throne and died. Now that's the evangelistic version. You say, have you ever preached that? Yep, I have, and it always gets results. But just to take the Bible face value, the Bible doesn't say that he died instantly when the angel smote him with worms. The Bible says the angel smote him with worms and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. How long, I don't know. Whether he was eaten of worms for a day, two days, a week, a month, I don't know. But whenever the worms stopped eating, he stopped living and the Holy Ghost, it says he didn't give up the Holy Ghost, he gave up the ghost, not the Holy Ghost. Herod never had the Holy Ghost, but he gave up the spirit. He died. Now, I said all that to say this. No matter where you find yourself, learn to take a nap in the arms of Jesus Christ. No matter what tomorrow is streaming, take time to relax in the providence and the greatness of God. If you're facing a surgery, if you're facing a, a trial, if you're facing a burden, if you're facing a, a, a days ahead something that you dread, take the time like Peter and say, it is what it is. My Lord loves me. It is what it is. And Peter just snuggles up, takes one of the muscles of those soldiers and fluffs it up like a pillow. And Peter just lays his head on those soldiers Big old muscle, and you snuggled in. And the soldier thought, this guy's gonna die in the morning. And he's using my muscles as a pillow. Well, let me tell you, friends, if you got Jesus, you can use the muscles of this world, and you can use them as a pillow. Because Jesus Christ is bigger than what you face tomorrow. He's bigger than what you'll face the days ahead, and I do believe that our country is facing some tough times ahead. I'm not a doomsday preacher, but I am a realistic preacher, and I do know that when Jesus Christ comes, this world's going into panic and total darkness. And we as children of God are gonna be caught up in complete confidence with our Lord. And we're gonna be okay. Everything's gonna be all right. Amen? Terry wrote a song, Everything's Gonna Be All Right. And talked about the mortgages due. Talked about sickness. Talked about storm. Talked about kicked out of school. Talked about I'm going to die. It doesn't matter. Laughing at the devil all day long. Hello. Terry knew what it was like. I pray. I don't pray for Terry, but I pray and thank God for Terry. And one thing I can say about Terry, Terry knew that he was going. He knew he was going home. And he went home like a champ. And everybody in this room can do the same. You can go be a champ. Because God will take you through. And he'll watch over you and he'll bless you. Amen. Stand with me.
laughing at the devil all day long. Old Chuck used to get to laughing at in that song, and he'd just laugh and laugh. We had a guy get mad at us for that. We Chuck was on the platform, and, 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 and Terry was singing, laughing at the devil all day long, and, oh, and everybody would start laughing, and Chuck would just, Chuck has a belly laugh. And he started laughing. Everybody got laughing and got tickled and they were laughing. And some guy after church came up to me. I'll not tell you who it was, but he came up to me and he said, I don't think that's right. I said, what do you mean you don't think that's right? He said, I think you ought to reverence the devil. And I said, well, you go ahead and reverence him all he wants. Jesus put a laugh on me about that. I'm not afraid of the devil. He is a, he's a, he's a real enemy he has real power but it's only given to him by God and I'm going to go I'm going to go through life laughing not crying Amen. amen well needless to say he didn't stay in the church very long I guess he was too busy reverencing the devil giving reverence to him amen he hated that song, going to the enemy's camp and taking back that which the devil stole from me. And he hated that song. Well, he hated a lot of our songs. In fact, I think he hated a lot of my sermons. Well, wherever he's at now, he don't have to hate anymore. He can just love whatever's going on at his place. But I want to say to everybody in this room, settle down, just snuggle in, Get a good night's rest tonight. Peter slept while his head was going to roll the next morning. But Peter wasn't afraid. He just said, Peter said by his sleeping, everything is going to be all right. And I want to say to everybody in this room, everything is going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Say it's going to be all right. God's going to sing. We're going to give an invitation. We're going to come and pray. Everything is going to be all right. You come.